Okay, what is up guys? Welcome back to the BTB Fitness Podcast and welcome back to the YouTube channel. So today is a very special day. Uh, today the Yankees re-signed Aaron Judge, hence the Yankees beanie. So all is right with the world. Uh, Aaron Judge is staying in New York. Uh, no need to panic any longer. If you don't pay attention to baseball, then uh, completely ignore that. But I am a huge Yankees fan, uh, so I am thrilled uh, to see that Aaron Judge is staying in New York. Uh, in all seriousness, today is a, a pretty big day for me uh, and Zuki today because Zuki and I are going to give you guys the ultimate guide to deloads. So uh, this will be the greatest guide to deloads that has ever been created. Whoever your favorite fitness influencer or educator is who has a, a deload guide, uh, it's not as good as mine, period. So uh, whatever you learn from theirs, get rid of it. Focus on mine only. Okay, obviously I'm, I'm just playing around, uh, but in all seriousness, uh, I am very excited to make this video today. Um, I don't know how many of you guys who are listening to this video uh, are followers of me on TikTok. I would assume that probably a good chunk uh, of you guys simply because uh, TikTok is the social media account that I have that has the largest following. But uh, my very first video that I ever got a million views on on TikTok was a video about deloading. Uh, and ever since then, I feel like I get more questions about deloads than anything else. And so uh, I've made tons and tons and tons of content on deloads uh, on TikTok, Instagram, even YouTube. Uh, but I kind of wanted to get all uh, of my thoughts in one place like this uh, and kind of have like this all in one uh, type of approach uh, to deloads. So that is what we are going to go over today. Just a heads up uh, for any of you guys who are listening to the audio version of the podcast right now, um, I suggest that you guys uh, watch the video version of the podcast this week, uh, just because there's going to be some visuals and stuff that you guys uh, may or may not want to see. I think it will probably uh, make what I'm trying to say make a little bit more sense uh, if you guys see the visuals as well. So um, we're going to go ahead and we are going to get into this. The very first thing that we're going to go over is we're going to go over the itinerary for today. So we're going to go over the things that we are going to cover uh, and hopefully the questions that you guys will be able to answer by the time this video is done. So first we're going to cover what is a deload, then we're going to cover why do we deload, then we'll take a look at who needs to deload and who may not need to deload, when do we need to deload and what are some signs that we can look out for uh, to know that it may be a good idea for us to deload. How do we actually go about doing a deload? Uh, I'll give you guys some considerations and some things to kind of think about while you're in your deload phase. Uh, and then we'll wrap this up with some frequently asked questions. Uh, like I said, I feel like deloads are probably the topic that I get the most questions about uh, when it comes to uh, TikTok, Instagram, whatever. I get tons and tons and tons of questions uh, on those social media platforms. So I wanted to take uh, some of the questions that I get over and over and over again uh, and address those. Um, before we get into this, uh, I feel like I need to make it clear that this video uh, is pertaining to deloads for a hypertrophy based program. So for bodybuilders, this is not covering deloads for strength outcomes. So if you're uh, a power lifter or an Olympic lifter, uh, unfortunately, this video will not be very applicable to you. Uh, I am a hypertrophy trainer. Uh, and so hypertrophy training is the um, lens in which I view everything through. So uh, this is going to be pertaining to deloads for bodybuilders and for hypertrophy training outcomes. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So first things first, what is a deload? So all that a deload is, is a period of time where fatigue management becomes our number one priority. Up until the point where we need a deload in our training program, our number one priority is taking performance increases in the gym. It's getting stronger in the gym, uh, using the same weight for more reps, uh, a combination of the two, improving our form, increasing tension within the muscle, et cetera, et cetera. 
but there will eventually come a point where our number one focus needs to shift from making progress into getting rid of fatigue. And that phase is known as a deload phase. Now there are some other priorities that we're trying to take care of while we're in this phase aside from just accumulating, or excuse me, from managing accumulated fatigue, um, such as managing injuries uh, and kind of reigniting your motivation to train. We'll kind of talk about these things as we get further into the video today, but uh, those are gonna be some kind of secondary uh, reasons or benefits in which we would deload. But the main overarching thing uh, that we are trying to do with a deload phase is to get rid of fatigue that we have accumulated. And a deload is going to conclude the current training block that you're in, and it's going to give you a period of time for you to mentally and physically prepare for your next training block. So hopefully you guys will be pretty familiar with a lot of the terminology by now, uh, with more when we're looking at our mesocycles and stuff within training, we have training blocks, which are basically a period of time in which we are accumulating and increasing performance. Uh, and in order to kind of finish off a training block and then start the next training block we have to have a period of time in between there uh, in which we kind of recover from the previous training block and get ready for the next one uh, and that is going to be uh, another purpose uh, of the deload phase why do we need to deload? So this is a pretty important concept uh, for us to, to kind of grasp because uh, you know deloads are something that a lot of us may be really familiar with. Uh, at least we've heard the term before. Uh, we know you know what it is that we're supposed to be doing, uh, but we may not know why it is that we are doing this in the first place. And so the reason why we deload is because as we are progressing through a training block, as we're going week after week after week, improving our gym performance, we are going to accumulate fatigue as our performance increases. So every time that we go into the gym and we uh, take a progression on our lift, there is a price that we have to pay for that. We can't just go into the gym, throw five pounds on the bench, match the reps from last week, and all is good with the world. We have to pay a price for that. There's a certain amount of fatigue uh, that a set like that will accumulate. And so uh, that is, is one of the main reasons why we need to deload is because eventually, over time, week after week after week after week as the training block goes on, this fatigue will accumulate. I know I've said this a couple of times by now, but every workout that you do will elicit a stimulus, but it will also uh, elicit a certain amount of fatigue. And as the weeks go on and on and on and on, that fatigue builds and builds and builds and builds and gets higher and higher. Eventually, that fatigue will get to a point where it is so high that it prevents us from continuing to make even more progress in the gym. And it causes a plateau. That's something that a lot of us are very familiar with, whether we're familiar with the terminology uh, or it's actually happened to us in the sense where we're going in the gym and we're putting our best foot forward every day. We're doing all the things that we need to do outside of the gym in terms of managing our training, uh, volume, uh, hydration, stress management, nutrition, and we still cannot uh, make progress. So we have a plateau, we have a roadblock that is blocking us uh, from continuing to make progress. We need to get rid of this fatigue so that we can continue to make progress and we can continue to get better in the gym. Otherwise, we're gonna stay in the same place and we're gonna continue to spin our wheels. And if that phase continues long enough, we'll eventually start to regress and actually lose performance in the gym. And that will actually lead to muscle loss and muscle wasting. This will be a graph here that I think is gonna be important for you guys uh, to see. So this is a really, really basic uh, picture. You know, this is, this is not a, a very scientific graph uh, at all, but uh, it, it really kind of makes the, the point well understood. So uh, you'll see on our left-handed axis, we have uh, results, performance, uh, and on the bottom axis, we have time. So as time goes on within a training block, our results will eventually increase uh, up until a point in which they kind of taper off, and this is going to be a plateau. Now, this is important to understand because most athletes and most people that get into bodybuilding are
are very uh, type A people. They're very driven people. They're people that enjoy working hard. They know how to work hard. Bodybuilding attracts people like that because bodybuilding is a sport where it's kind of pretty obvious and straightforward in the sense that the more uh, effort and the more work that we put in, uh, the more progress that we get. And so by default and by nature, bodybuilding is a sport that attracts people who are very driven. And because of this, most athletes' natural reaction when they hit a plateau is to work harder. I mean, think about uh, what a bodybuilder's most common uh, thought process and, and mentality is. Uh, you know, you get to a point, I'm not losing weight anymore. I'm going to eat less food and do more cardio. I'm going to make it happen. My body weight is not increasing anymore. I'm going to continue to force more food down my throat, uh, maybe do less steps or something, uh, but I, I'm going to make it happen. And so most people's natural reaction when they get into a plateau is to work harder to try and push through that barrier. And that is very often the incorrect and inappropriate thing to do. We actually need to do the opposite and we actually need to take a step back and just kind of clear that fatigue uh, so that we can continue to, to push forward and make progress. I want to continue on why do we deload. So uh, this is something that a lot of people may not think about, but this is kind of my, my personal uh, thought process and my personal mentality with this. Bodybuilding is a performance-based sport, and, and typically when we think about uh, performance-based sports, we typically think about uh, traditional ball sports, football, baseball, basketball. Maybe we think about combat sports like MMA or jiu-jitsu or boxing or something like that. Uh, we typically don't group uh, bodybuilding into a performance-based sport. Now, I want to make it clear that actual competition bodybuilding, stepping on a stage, is not a performance-based sport, but the actual act of bodybuilding, building someone's body, is a performance-based sport. The way that we accrue muscle mass over time is by continually improving our gym performance, also known as progressive overload. And progressive overload is the key driving factor behind muscle uh, hypertrophy, getting bigger muscles. And so performance and maximizing our performance is the overarching uh, theme that we need to focus on and the lens in which we need to view our training through. And so improving your performance is the number one priority. In all of our performance-based sports, whether again, we're talking about a combat sport, we're talking about a ball sport, all athletes in all performance-based sports have dedicated times of the year in which they are not pushing at their maximum intensity and maybe they're purposely doing things uh, in a lesser fashion in order to recoup, recover, and get ready to do that again. Uh, I mean, all ball sports have an off-season. All combat sports uh, are typically doing relatively comparatively light work uh, than what they do versus when they're in camp or a prep uh, before they get into their fight, and that's usually when their uh, you know workload increases. But all athletes in all performance-based sports have dedicated periods of time in which they are purposely not working as hard as they can in order to minimize fatigue uh, and kind of reset themselves and get themselves ready to push again. And so because of that, why would bodybuilding be any different? Why would bodybuilding be the performance-based sport in which there's an exception uh, to the rule where we can just continue to push and push and push and push uh, and never stop? Spoiler alert, it isn't. And uh, people who uh, are uh, executing a hypertrophy-based program improperly may be under that uh, impression. But for uh, a, a proper hypertrophy program uh, to be designed in order to allow for maximum progress, we do need to have these dedicated periods of time in there uh, in which we are resting and which we are recovering. And this becomes even more so important when you understand and accept the fact that bodybuilding is going to require anywhere from five to 10 years at an absolute minimum in order for you to reach your personal peak, in order for you to reach your individual best, 
that is going to take five years minimum. For most people, it's gonna take closer to 10 to 15 years of constant grinding, day in and day out, week in and week out, blah, 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 blah. It is going to take five to 10 years at the absolute minimum. You can do everything correctly for the next five to 10 years, and it will still take you five to 10 years in order to reach uh, that level. Uh, bodybuilding is a you know very strange sport in a sense where uh, we can, you know, the, the human body can really only synthesize so much muscle uh, at a certain rate. Even with anabolics, even doing everything properly with our training and nutrition, the human body can still only create muscle tissue so fast. And so in order to reach uh, our peak and reach the best that we can possibly be, five to 10 years is going to be the minimum amount of time that you're going to want to dedicate to bodybuilding uh, in order to get there. And so if we know that five to 10 years is gonna be the minimum amount of time that we need to invest, the concept of longevity and being able to do this for a very long time is not only uh, very important, it's also non-negotiable. We don't have a choice. We are going to have to try and uh, view things in a way that maximizes longevity and allows us to be the best that we can possibly be uh, for an extended period of time. So that is uh, another a very important reason in, in, in which we deload because if we don't, we overtrain, we get injured, uh, and, and the concept of longevity kind of gets flushed down the toilet in that instance. Who needs a deload and potentially who may not need a deload? So everyone needs a deload, realistically. Um, if you don't feel the need to deload, I would really take into question your training intensity are you training hard enough to cause a significant amount of fatigue in order to actually warrant the need for a deload? And if the answer to that question is no, uh, I would uh, you know, urge you guys to look at your training intensity and consider uh, increasing that uh, and, and picking that up so that you're actually training hard enough to actually need a deload. And there may be some people out there that may say that ah, you, know, you, you don't need to train so hard to the point where uh, you're actually causing a uh, significant amount of fatigue in order to make progress, and I actually disagree with that. Uh, I think it's uh, very well uh, established that unless you are a beginner, muscle mass is something that our body does not want to put on uh, its frame. Uh, muscle mass has a high oxygen demand, it has a high water demand, uh, it's very heavy on your skeletal frame, and so we need to force our body to put muscle on, and the way that we do that is by training with a level of intensity that uh, is intense enough in order to warrant a hypertrophic response, and a byproduct of training hard is accumulating fatigue. So uh, I don't know if there is anybody out there that uh, you know is uh, maybe arguing that you can maybe uh, train at lesser intensities for longer periods of time to eliminate the need uh, for a deload, but that is not a concept that I personally uh, agree with. I think it's been pretty well established that training needs to be hard and needs to incrementally get harder as it goes on and on and on in order to continue uh, giving the stimulus that we need for muscle growth. So everyone needs a deload. And if you don't need a deload, uh, then you have a, a major flaw in your training intensity. And, and that would be uh, the number one thing that I would focus on is improving that. When should we deload? So how often is a deload something uh, that we should do? So there are two different thought processes here. Uh, we can do this proactively and we can do this reactively. Uh, I'll kind of get into each one here. So deloads are taken proactively um, due to uh, an athlete's uh, lack of ability to gauge their own biofeedback. And this is something that is uh, more applicable to beginners, uh, in my opinion. I think that people who are beginners and intermediates should be deloading uh, every four to eight weeks. Now, I know that that is a range, and you're probably wondering, how do I determine where I am uh, in uh, that uh, spectrum? How, where do I decide uh, how often to deload? In my opinion, I think this is going to be largely determined by your ability to train hard. If you're someone who can train very, very hard, and by hard, I mean you can train very accurately, uh, your form is exquisite, uh, it, it's on point, uh, you're not using any momentum uh, or any poor movement mechanics in order to uh, complete your exercises, 
and you're able to train in a close proximity to failure, if not get all the way to failure consistently, it's very likely to believe that you will be accumulating fatigue quicker than somebody who is not training as close to failure as, as you are and or is also moving uh, their weights with less control as you. So if you're someone who can train much harder, you'll probably be closer to that four week mark. And if you're somebody who probably doesn't train as hard, you're probably gonna be closer to that eight week mark. Regardless, if you're someone who is a beginner or an intermediate trainee, I do think that deloads are something that you should schedule and something that you should plan into your program uh, because uh, if, if you're a beginner or you're an intermediate, you're probably relatively inexperienced in the sense of being able to gauge your body's feedback and kind of determine uh, how it is that you feel uh, in, in order to know when to take one. Now, if you're somebody who is an advanced trainee, by this point, you've probably dedicated three, four, five plus years uh, of real training. I'm not talking about three to four to five years uh, of just being in the gym. I'm talking about three to five years of being in the gym with a solid nutrition plan, with a solid training program. So this, you know, if I've kind of talked about this on, on different videos and I don't want to go uh, off on too much of a tangent in this video, but there are lots of people and probably some people who are watching this video right now who have been going to the gym for three to five years, but that entire time they've just been kind of winging it. They haven't been following a good training program. They haven't been following a good nutrition program. And even so they've been going to the gym for three to five years, I would still consider that person uh, a beginner or an intermediate. Uh, I think that your um, training experience, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, advanced trainee, uh, is more determined by your training age, more so than uh, total time uh, spent in the gym working out. And, and it's important that I say training age because being in the gym and training versus being in the gym and working out are two very different things. So I don't want to you know, go too off on, on too much of a tangent there. Um, but I, I do think that once you become an advanced trainee, usually by that point, you've spent a considerable amount of time kind of learning your body's biofeedback. Uh, I'll use myself in, as an example about this. Uh, I know that when my sleep and my digestion start to get impacted, it's probably time for me to take a deload. Now, somebody who's a beginner or inter an intermediate trainee, if their sleep or digestion starts to get messed up, uh, they may not know that that's something uh, that's kind of uh, signifying to them that they need to take a deload. And I'll, I'll kind of get into some of the uh, symptoms and things that we can look out for uh, in a little bit here. Uh, but the point still stands, and even with myself, when I was a beginner or an intermediate trainee, if I was just getting poor night's sleep out of nowhere, I'm thinking, what, what's going on here? What's going on? Like, I have no idea why it is that all of a sudden my sleep uh, has just gone to complete shit. But as I become more and more advanced, when those things happen to me, I'm able to connect the dots and understand, okay, my sleep is getting poor because of this, and I need to do this uh, in order to fix it. So once you kind of get to the point where you're an advanced trainee, in my opinion, I believe that you earn the right to um, shift your deload process from a proactive approach into a reactive approach. Uh, again, because you uh, have gained the knowledge and you've gained the skill uh, in order to be able to tell when it is that you need one. Even if you're somebody who is taking your deloads reactively, I would still throw a deload in at the absolute uh, you know, least possible frequency every eight to 10 weeks or so. And if you're advanced and you're not needing to deload every eight to 10 weeks, I would really question your training intensity and your overall workload, uh, as we kind of talked about earlier. Another side tangent that I don't want to go on, but actually as you become more and more and more advanced, it makes sense that you need to deload more frequently uh, because your ability to accumulate fatigue uh, will increase as you get more skilled uh, at training in the gym uh, and uh, progress will actually be harder to come by the closer that we get to our genetic limit. And so the need for a deload will be more frequent. So if you're somebody who is an advanced trainee and you're still training every eight to 10 weeks and not really feeling a major pressing need to pull back and take a deload, again, I would really, really question uh, how hard are you pushing yourself? 
Are you truly doing enough work in the gym? And is the quality uh, of that work high enough in order to warrant a, a hypertrophic response? Let's talk about some of the signs that you can uh, kind of uh, read on your body to know when it is that you need to take a deload. So deloading is not something that just kind of pops out of the blue and you're like, okay, I need to deload. Your body will give you feedback that it needs to rest and recover. And being able to uh, read that feedback and understand what is going on is going to be a very important piece uh, of maximizing your time. Because uh, if, if we have periods of time where let's say I needed to deload three weeks ago, but I continued to push on that whole three week period of time, I probably wasn't making progress. If I was making progress, I probably wasn't making progress at the rate that I could have been if I had deloaded uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, and when we take a look at that uh, over the course of a year, you know that's a considerable amount of time that we're spending uh, each year not making progress. So uh, it's important to understand that these things won't just kind of pop out of nowhere. Your body will give you some warning signs that it needs to, to deload. And being able to read those and understand what those are uh, is going to be a very important skill for you to acquire. So when we start to get these symptoms, uh, that's a telltale sign that our body's central nervous system is shifted into a sympathetically dominant state more so than a parasympathetic dominant state. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with the central nervous system and its uh, kind of different branches and the, the different states that it may be in. Um, but for those who aren't, uh, our central nervous system can either be dominant in, in one of two uh, states, so to say. So uh, your, your central nervous system can be sympathetically dominant uh, and your sympathetic nervous system is going to be your flight or fight response, fight or flight. Uh, I kind of got those mixed up, but your fight or flight response. Uh, so when your body is stressed and tense, uh, it's trying to either fight or flight. You, you know, your body's on high alert basically uh, and the body is really, really stressed. Now on the flip side, the opposite of that is the rest and digest state, which is the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. And as the, uh, you know, the description suggests, uh, in this state, our central nervous system is a lot more calmed down, our ability to sleep uh, and digest our food, and just overall relax and chill out uh, is going to be uh, much, much, much easier than being in a sympathetically uh, dominant state. Just to kind of give you guys some really elementary examples uh, of what this would be. Being in the gym, your body is sympathetically driven. You're probably taking some caffeine. You're probably listening to some loud music. You probably got a certain amount of uh, anger or aggression that you're dealing with and, and using that to kill the weights. When you're laying on the couch at night watching The Simpsons or whatever it is that, that you guys like to watch uh, and you're just chilling out, eating your last meal, that's your body in a parasympathetic state. You guys can kind of understand like the drastic uh, differences between uh, those two uh, situations and, and kind of maybe connect the dots a little bit uh, as to each one's uh, will say. And so the symptoms that you will be feeling when you need to deload are symptoms of a central nervous system that is sympathetically driven uh, and is more in its fight or flight response than it is in its rest or digest response. Uh, your body is in a period of time where it's stressed out basically. So you're, like I said, your, your body will be giving you some, uh, some warning signs of that. Uh, and there is a laundry list of them, which I'll go over here. Um, decreased sleep quality and or quantity. So you're not sleeping as much. You're having a hard time falling asleep. You're having a hard time staying asleep or you're getting the same amount of sleep, but the quality that you feel uh, is considerably less. Maybe you wake up in the morning and you don't feel uh, as rested and you don't feel as uh, recovered. Decreased libido uh, and a loss of sex drive is going to be another common one. Uh, a sudden loss of appetite if you're in the middle of a cut and you're starving uh, and progressively day after day after day you wake up less and less and less and less and less hungry. Uh, that may be another symptom uh, of a, a deload needing to be taken. Uh, spontaneous digestive issues with no change in your diet at all. So if you've been eating the same foods for the past however long and you've never had digestive issues and then all of a sudden you start getting bloated, diarrhea, gassy on the same foods. You didn't change anything with your nutrition and all of a sudden your body's digestion uh, has really taken a hit. Uh, then this would be another one. 
a decreased mental desire to train. This is a really, really common one that I experience with myself and a lot of my clients experience. Uh, a lot of people will be able to attest to this one too. Uh, I'm someone who loves training. I love training more than anything in the world. Training is my job. Training is my uh, passion. Training is my stress management. Training is my entire life. And so I love training more than anything in the world. I, I love going to the gym on my training days and fucking killing it in the gym. So when I have multiple days in a row where I'm going to the gym and I'm thinking, I really don't want to be here right now. I would rather be at home doing something else. That kind of raises a red flag in my head. Maybe I'm a little overtrained right now and maybe I need to just chill out a little bit. Increased injuries or niggles. So maybe again, kind of, you know, the same process as the digestive one, you don't change anything in your training program. And all of a sudden uh, you start getting injuries and stuff out of nowhere, or your shoulder starts bothering you or your knee starts bothering you could be another uh, indicative sign that you may need to, to deload a little bit. And then the, the worst one, uh, and one that kind of makes itself the most obvious, uh, is decreased training performance and or lack of training progression. So uh, maybe you've been following the same training program for six months, you've been able to take uh, constant progressions, 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 and then eventually you kind of get to uh, a point where um, you can no longer take progress in your gym and you never have, uh, never you know, changed anything up until this point, uh, just for whatever reason, uh, you can't make progress or, or, or worst case scenario, your strength is actually going downwards. Uh, I want to make it clear that this is not something that happens on like uh, one lift. This is something that kind of happens across the board uh, and it happens in multiple workouts. So uh, if you have one workout where one of your exercises uh, performance doesn't increase right away, that may be uh, or may not be indicative that you need to take a deload. But if you have like three to four workouts in a row where multiple exercises in those workouts stall or they go backwards, that would raise a huge red flag to me that, that you're a little overtrained. Okay, so let's talk about how to deload. This is probably the main reason why a lot of you guys kind of clicked on this video. So uh, I think a lot of people are going to be really familiar with, uh, you know, the whys and, and, and why do we do this. Uh, but a, a lot of people seem to be confused about how to actually go about doing this, uh, at least for my DMs. Uh, this seems to be the most common question that I get uh, when it comes to deloading is how do I actually go about doing this? So the first thing that we need to understand uh, is the main goal. What is it that we are trying to do when we enter a deload phase? Uh, as I've kind of addressed a couple of times before, the main goal of this phase is to reduce fatigue. And the way that we go about reducing fatigue is largely personal preference. We have many, many, many ways in which we can go about uh, reducing fatigue. When we take a look at our training program, we have four main variables that we can really play with and manipulate uh, in order to change uh, the fatigue levels of our training. So we have training volume, the total number of sets that we're doing. We have training intensity, and by intensity, I mean proximity to failure. How close are we getting to failure? Uh, in the strength world, intensity means percentage of one rep max. Uh, I do not use uh, intensity to um, describe percentage of one rep max. I use intensity to, to describe proximity to failure. We have a frequency, so how frequently are we training uh, and how frequently are we training certain muscle groups. And then we have load, which is percentage of one rep max. So uh, I use the term load uh, to uh, describe a percentage of one rep max instead of intensity. Uh, as I said, intensity uh, means proximity to failure. So I just wanna make that really clear again. Now, obviously, we can manipulate one or more of these things uh, in order to reduce fatigue and facilitate recovery. Basically, I kind of think about this as a puzzle. We've got four pieces, uh, and we can kind of you know change these things uh, as we will. Or maybe we think about it as like um, uh, maybe a pie chart uh, or something like that. You guys know what a pie chart is, right? Like the, the circles with the, the different pieces in there. Uh, we have our four main variables and we can kind of, you know, bring some certain things up and bring certain things down uh, in order to achieve the goal the goals that we are trying to uh, achieve. So um, a couple things that we can 
manipulate here. Uh, like I said at the very beginning, as long as the fatigue is getting reduced, the method of deload uh, is really largely personal preference. We, we can really uh, do many different things uh, and achieve the same result. So it, it's gonna largely come down to how do you, the viewer and the listener, like to do this. So I'm gonna get into the examples of the deloads uh, and then I kinda wanna go over some of the pros and cons uh, of each one uh, and then kind of uh, highlight uh, the different ways that we can go about doing this. So there are two major methods, uh, two major ways that we can deload. Method number one is we can just straight up take a complete week of rest. Uh, and this is very simple. We just take a week off of training. We just don't go to the gym for a week. This is going to allow uh, for both a mental and a physical reset. So obviously the physical reset is pretty straightforward. We're not going to the gym. Our body is resting and recovering, but it also allows for a mental reset. And I personally find that this method of deloading, taking a complete week off of the gym, uh, is very applicable in a vacation situation or in a situation where life happens. For example, I work with tons of clients right now who are either in high school or college, and I'm making this video on December 7th, so I don't know when you guys are watching this, but right around this time of year is usually when school starts winding down and finals start picking up. School uh, students' workload typically uh, increases, uh, and a lot of these students are also working and stuff at the same time while they're still going to school. So in a situation like this, this is a great opportunity if you need to deload to just take a complete week off the gym. When life happens, uh, I find that forcing yourself to still go into the gym and kind of uh, finding time and making time to go to the gym uh, can be a real struggle for a lot of people. And so often in this situation, just taking a complete week off of the gym is going to be your best uh, possible case scenario. Also with vacation, maybe you're coming uh, into the summertime and maybe you've got a one week vacation going up. Your family's going to California or Florida or something. Like This would be a really good opportunity to just take a complete week off the gym and just not worry about training. Now obviously if you're somebody who likes to train on vacation, that's fine. I personally don't like to train on vacation. When I go on vacation, I'm in vacation mode. So I don't really like to train uh, when I'm in the gym. So uh, for me, in a situation like this, just taking a complete week off of the gym uh, is going to be a very applicable uh, way to do things. Now, the pros and cons uh, of taking a complete week uh, off the gym. So some of the pros, so some of the good things of this uh, is that it allows for a physical and a mental reset. Like I said, uh, you, you kind of just stop going to the gym for a week. Uh, it kind of refreshes you by the time that week is over. You're typically ready to get back into the gym, kind of ready to get back to normal schedule uh, and kind of get back to doing what you love doing. And obviously your body's going to feel uh, noticeably more uh, refreshed as well just because you haven't been going to the gym uh, for a week. Um, this lets you fully enjoy vacations, uh, if that's the scenario, like I, I said earlier. Uh, when I go on vacation, I'm in vacation mode, baby. I am not training. Uh, I, I just, I don't really like to train uh, when I'm on vacation, unless I would be somewhere where there's like a destination gym, like I'm in, you know, Dallas and destination Dallas is right there, or I'm in Venice Beach and Gold's Venice is like right there. Uh, but if it's just, you know, I'm going to wherever in Florida or wherever in wherever, like if I'm probably not going to train, uh, I, I typically don't enjoy training while I'm on vacation. So uh, this kind of lets uh, you uh, fully enjoy uh, that vacation time uh, and really make the most of it. Because I don't know about you guys, uh, but vacations are not something that I do super frequently. And so when I do take them, I fucking like to enjoy them. So uh, that, that's kind of me personally. Um, like I said, this is very applicable in situations where life happens. Finals are going on. Uh, school is going on. Um, you've got a loved one who is sick, some, something, anything along those lines. Uh, in a situation where the schedule gets really jam-packed uh, and very busy, this is a great way to deload and drop some fatigue. It's just stop going to the gym for a week. 
Um, and it also allows you to save time in your daily schedule, which kind of goes with the point before. Uh, if you're someone who has a really, really busy workload, even finding time to go to the gym and do deload workouts uh, is going to be a time commitment that you have to commit to. Uh, and so if you don't have that time, uh, I don't think that forcing yourself to make it happen uh, in most cases uh, is going to be the smartest approach. I, I think that just uh, taking the time off uh, is going to be a good way to go about doing things. Now, some of the cons of a complete week of rest and some of the, the more less than ideal things uh, that could possibly happen here uh, is that many people struggle mentally to take time off of the gym. A lot of people love going to the gym. Uh, it's the highlight of their day. Uh, they, they really struggle with the thought of not going to the gym. And so if you're someone who just loves to be in the gym, even when you're super tired, then a complete week of rest is probably not the approach that you should take because uh, you're not going to be very happy uh, doing that. Um, it can also take some time for people to get back in the swing of things after they take a week off of the gym. So after they take a week off of the gym, maybe they come in and, and they're not as familiar uh, with their press or their squatting movement or their rowing movement. Uh, and it may take some time for them to kind of get back into the swing of things uh, and kind of get used to, to going through their workouts again. So that, that time that is spent getting back uh, into the swing of things, say for example, you take a week off and then it takes a week for you to kind of get back into the swing of things, uh, that one week where you're kind of getting back into the swing of things, I wish I had a dollar for every time I said that, uh, but, but that week where you're spent getting acclimated to everything again, theoretically is kind of wasted time. Uh, you know, you, you could have potentially deloaded in a way that made it so that you don't need to spend a week uh, kind of getting back into things. But uh, again, some people don't experience this at all. So if, if you're someone who notices every time you take some time off of the gym, uh, it takes you some time to kind of get back into the swing of things, uh, this may not be the approach for you either. And then also, uh, there's a loss of the social aspect of the gym. Now, uh, for lots of people, the gym is not just uh, a stress management thing or a training thing. It's a social thing. It's a thing where people go and talk to people and make friends and, and things along those lines. Uh, and so a week uh, of time out of the gym may leave people feeling uh, like there's a certain hole in their social life, uh, so to say. Um, for example, like I'm, I'm an online coach right now. So, so I spend every day sitting at home doing nothing. The only, I mean, not, not doing nothing. I I'm obviously working, but, uh, talking to nobody. Uh, so, uh, I live, uh, you know, with my girlfriend obviously, but, uh, I work from home. So, uh, I am all alone. The only time that I ever leave my house is when I go to the gym, uh, or when I go to like the grocery store or something. So for me, the social aspect of the gym, uh, even though you know being social in the gym is not my number one priority, uh, it is really my only form of uh, like a social life, so to say, uh, at this current point in my life. So uh, taking a week of time off the gym uh, may leave a hole in my life uh, in terms of of, of my social life. So, uh, if you're someone who, uh, is an online coach or maybe you're not, you're just a, you're a social butterfly and you love to talk to people and you love to meet new people. Uh, again, this may not be the most applicable, uh, approach for you. Now the second, uh, method of deloading and probably the one that most people are going to opt to choose, uh, is what I call an active deload. Now, the only reason why I call this an active deload, uh, is because you're going to the gym and still training. This is not some sort of like revolutionary, like way to deload or, or anything. It's just a terminology that I made up to, to describe, uh, the fact that you're not deloading from complete rest. Uh, you're deloading from still going to the gym and working out, um, but you're making modifications. So an active deload is still going to the gym and training, but you're going to be doing modified workouts. And those modified workouts uh, are going to be made with adjustments to the training variables that I mentioned earlier volume, intensity, frequency, and load. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through each one of these variables and I'm gonna talk about each one specifically uh, and kind of some of the ways that we can manipulate uh, each of these four variables for an active deload. So variable number one is going to be training volume, total number of sets that we are doing. 
In my personal opinion, training volume is the biggest culprit of fatigue accumulation, uh, which is contrary to most people's initial guess. I think if you were to ask somebody, uh, you know, the average gym goer, what causes more fatigue, doing three sets at one RAR or doing one set at zero RAR, I think most people's natural inclination would be to say the second option because you're training harder, you're training with a higher level of intensity uh, and closer to failure, and so therefore you would cause more fatigue. Uh, but some, from some of the literature that I have read and from my own personal experience, this is with myself and with training dozens and dozens and dozens of clients, I actually find that the first option, doing more total volume, is going to be more fatiguing than doing less volume uh, of a higher intensity. And the way that I like to think about this is if intensity is the stimulus that we are providing to our body, the volume is the dosage of that stimulus. So how much uh, of that are we putting uh, in the body? And as with all, uh, you know, this, this may be a, a phrase that some of you guys may have heard uh, before, and, and this has to do with anything, man, whether it's a drug, it usually gets referenced with drugs, but uh, whether it's a drug, whether it's a... Uh, a food, whether it's uh, an activity, uh, the damage is in the dose. Uh, and I mean, let's use a simple one, candy bars. There's nothing wrong with eating a candy bar. Like there, there's realistically like no damage that may be done from, from eating a candy bar. Now, if you're eating five candy bars, that's a different story. Uh, asking somebody to go and do a sprint, a 50 meter sprint, uh, is going to cause a certain amount of fatigue. But asking someone to go do six 50 meter sprints is going to cause disproportionately larger uh, amounts of fatigue. Everyone listening to this video can go do a 50 meter sprint and you may be tired for a little bit, but it's not going to break you. If some of us went and did six 50 meter sprints today, we would be destroyed uh, and, and sore and tired for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and so this is the way that I like to think about it. I think that um, the, the volume is the, the, the greatest culprit uh, to uh, fatigue accumulation, uh, especially with bodybuilders. Kind of going back to what I said earlier, uh, a lot of bodybuilders are type A driven people. that are, They're very, very motivated. Uh, a lot of them are under the impression that more is better and the more work that they do, uh, the better the results they can get, which often leads to them overdoing uh, the, the amount of work uh, that they need to do. So um, I, do, I do firmly believe personally that volume is, is the biggest culprit uh, of fatigue accumulation. Now, muscle gain is not the number one goal of a deload. Uh, as I've kind of talked about before, uh, fatigue management is going to be the number one goal of a deload. And so when it comes to your muscle size during a deload phase, I think it's really important that we shift our focal point and we shift our viewpoint. Um, from, uh, from a viewpoint of building muscle to just maintaining and preserving the muscle that we have while we really focus uh, on uh, accumulating or getting rid of that accumulated fatigue. Uh, and it is well documented in literature that the amount of volume that is required to maintain a muscle group uh, is not the same as the amount of muscle, uh, or excuse me, the amount of volume that is needed to grow a muscle group. We can maintain our muscle size with considerably less volume uh, than what is needed in order to build muscle mass. I also believe, uh, again, through personal anecdote and also through literature, uh, that training volume is also the biggest culprit of soft tendon issues and, and soft tendon injuries. Um, most people, uh, you know, we think about any sort of tendonitis that you've, knee tendonitis, elbow, shoulder, wrist, blah, 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 blah. Tendonitis is often an overuse injury. It, it, it's an injury that's caused from that particular area being used over and over and over and over again to the point where the tendons cannot keep up with the workload. So uh, tendon health has kind of been you know, pretty uh, well established that it's kind of uh, determined and dictated a lot more just by total wear and tear. The more total reps that we do, the more damage done to the tendon health, which obviously uh, makes sense. So, uh, and then uh, volume and fatigue are cumulative by nature, meaning that these two things uh, scale with each other. So as volume goes up, fatigue will go up as well. Uh, there is no scenario in which we can increase volume without increasing 
increasing fatigue uh, as well. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. So uh, that is training volume. That's, that's kind of uh, variable number one that we can play with. Variable number two is intensity. And, and as I've said tons of times in this video, by intensity I mean proximity to failure. Um, now, fatigue and proximity to failure are cumulative as well, just like how it is with volume. A set that's done at three RIR does not uh, cause the same amount of fatigue as a set that's done at one RIR. That is pretty uh, common sense. Scaling back on our intensity can allow for central nervous system repair since we won't be generating as much fatigue in each session. So again, uh, you know, a set done at three RIR does not cause as much CNS fatigue as a set done at one. We also have tons and tons of literature that, that prove uh, that we can get within four, uh, you know, four-ish RIR uh, and still be providing an adequate stimulus uh, for hypertrophy. Uh, and even if it's not an adequate stimulus for hypertrophy, it would definitely still be an adequate stimulus for muscle uh, preservation. Um, so even though that we do have some room to kind of scale back on our intensity during a deload, we still do need that intensity to be adequate enough in order to force the muscle to stick around. So just because we're going into a deload and we may pull back on our intensity doesn't mean that we're fucking around and, and that we're still not training hard anymore. We are still training hard. We're just maybe not training as hard as what we were doing throughout our main training block. Uh, and I think that this uh, kind of gives uh, some scope uh, to be able to train around the three to four reps in reserve mark. Uh, for those of you people who don't use reps in reserve, this would maybe be uh, you know similar to like a seven or an eight uh, RPE scale. Now the literature on this shows that we can train uh, anywhere from four to six reps in reserve and still provide an adequate stimulus. My personal opinion is that like, Six and five reps in reserve is, is kind of too far away uh, in order to be an adequate stimulus. I personally like my reps in reserve at the absolute, you know, furthest away from zero to be three to four, uh, preferably closer to three. Uh, with, with myself and honestly with a lot of my clients, uh, I can't think of a single instance in which I would have someone train at four reps in reserve. I usually will have people train at either three, two, one, or zero. Uh, I don't really see the need to train uh, in four, five, or six, despite what the literature says. So uh, intensity is another variable that we can manipulate in order to um, uh, allow for, for more fatigue. Next is frequency. So frequency can also be decreased uh, to allow for a smaller total workload during the deload phase. Uh, and this is often gonna come in the form of just adding in extra rest days into your split. Uh, so say, for example, you're training five days per week. If during your deload you start training three, that's obviously going to be decreasing the frequency in which you're training each of your muscle groups, which is going to be a good thing for the deload. Uh, this is also going to allow for soft tissue recovery, uh, as well as a total overall decrease in your workload. So for example, let's say your elbow is bothering you and you are currently training your biceps every other day. So maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, Tuesday, you know, so on and so forth. You're doing two sets of bicep curls. Maybe for the deload week, instead of training your biceps three to four times that week, maybe you only train them one to two times per week. That is going to allow you to be doing less curling motions throughout the week, which is going to decrease the overall stress and workload on the joint, uh, which is going to facilitate recovery. So uh, in increasing, or excuse me, decreasing your frequency uh, is not only going to help you uh, decrease your overall total workload, which is going to facilitate more recovery, uh, but it's also going to allow for localized recovery within your joints, especially if you're somebody who's dealing with uh, a tendonitis or a tendinosis of some sort uh, and you need to get that taken care of. And then finally, load. So load is another factor that we can manipulate. In my personal opinion, the load is the least important factor for us to manipulate. I do not think that the load is an issue. I think that the proximity to failure that we are training that load with is the major issue. And, and I think that this is really important thing to understand because uh, the main goal with hypertrophy training, 
uh, is to get as strong as we possibly can while still maintaining excellent uh, execution to make sure that we're using uh, the target muscles uh, to move the weight. And so we've currently spent the past training block and all the other training blocks before that building up our strength. Maybe we started uh, at a 185 bench and fast forward a year, uh, we've gotten ourselves up to benching 235. We put 50, 50 pounds on our bench, uh, let's say. That would be an awesome year of training. But for, for sake of this example, uh, let's just say that that is the case. I don't really see the point in taking a step away from that 235 pound um, uh, bench uh, in order to, to facilitate more recovery. What I think is a better approach is to stick with that 235 bench but not get as close to failure with it. Uh, and one of the main reasons for doing this is obviously we've spent a ton of time accumulating the strength to get up to the point where we can do a 235 bench. I think that we want to keep that as much as possible in order to keep the stimulus high in the muscle. And then obviously uh, reducing weight for a week may cause the weights to feel extra heavy when you kind of get back to them. So kind of in the same boat as taking uh, a complete week of rest, uh, when you kind of get, let's say you do a 235 bench and then you deload and you do a 185 bench and then it deloads over, you come back that next week and you do that 235 bench again, that first week that 235 bench may feel extra, extra heavy. Whereas if you had just stayed with the 235 bench during that deload and not taken it as close to failure, when you get back into it after the deload, it's probably not gonna feel super heavy because you just did it a, a week previous. It may actually feel lighter uh, because you're more recovered uh, and ready to go again. So uh, that is a, a very, very viable uh, uh, approach uh, to deloading is, is to keep the load high. Now the exception to this would be if you're dealing with a soft tissue injury. So again, with the, the elbow problem, if you've got an elbow that's bothering you, keeping your loads heavy may be contradictory to, uh, to getting rid of, of that injury. So in an instance like that, I do think that there is merit to reduce the load and work in higher rep ranges. But if your joints are okay and you have no issues with your joints at all, I would keep the load as high as possible because you've spent however long building your strength up to be able to handle that load. Uh, and again, I know I've said this a couple of times, I don't think it is the load that causes the fatigue uh, and, and causes the, uh, the central nervous system damage. I think it's the proximity to failure that we are training that load with. So let's kind of recap all of this. What do some of the X's and O's say? Like what are some of the things uh, that we can actually take uh, and are really more applicable to this? So in terms of training volume, I like to reduce training volume by 33 to 50%. Uh, depending on uh, how fatigued you are. So for example, if you're currently doing eight sets of back in a session, I would reduce that to either six to four. Uh, you know, if you're doing six sets, maybe you drop it to three, if you're doing four to two, so on and so forth. Ba basically, I would cut your total workload in half. I would do 50% volume uh, and, and, and that would be a really, really good uh, approach to take. Now, as far as intensity, I would train in the one to three reps in reserve range during a deload. This is less applicable to isolation lifts and more applicable to compound lifts. And even within our compound lifts, there are certain compound lifts where this is more uh, applicable to others. So for isolation lifts, we know that a, a, a a bicep curl taken to failure does not cause the same amount of fatigue as a deadlift taken to failure. And so with these easier exercises, these exercises that are relatively easier and cause less fatigue, I think that we can probably get closer to that one or even zero reps in reserve mark uh, during a deload with no issues. Now with your compound lifts, because you're using so much, uh, so many more muscle groups, you're using comparatively such heavier loads that are gonna cause way more fatigue per set. And so because of that, I think that our, uh, our, our compounds can afford to be uh, in a, in a uh, you know, higher reps and reserve type of approach, maybe two, three, uh, or maybe even four. Uh, and like I said, even within certain compounds, like a, an incline machine press is technically a compound lift, but an incline machine press to failure does not cause the same amount of fatigue uh, as a hack squat or an RDL does to failure. So typically like when I deload, I may use like a one or two reps in reserve on say a chest press, but I may use a two or three reps in reserve on an RDL or a hack squat because the RDL and the hack squat 
uh, cause more fatigue than, than what a chest press was. So uh, the reps in reserve that you're going to use uh, is, is going to be really dependent on the exercise that you're doing and how much uh, fatigue that exercise is cause. Uh, if you're doing uh, an exercise that doesn't really cause a lot of fatigue, I think you can still train that pretty hard. Uh, if you're looking at like a squat or a hip hinge pattern, uh, you may need to train two, three, four reps in reserve uh, on an exercise like that in order to, to really uh, mitigate the levels of fatigue. Uh, and as I said earlier, your intensity still must be fairly adequate in order to maintain the muscle uh, that you have, uh, uh, you know, accumulated up until this point. And you may even still be possibly growing from a deload. So let's say, for example, you know, I'm, I'm just going to make something up here. Normally, you do a chest press and you do three plates for six, and that's taken it to failure. Uh, if you go into a deload and you hit three plates for six, but that six reps is a one RIR, that may be a novel stimulus to your body and may be enough to warrant a hypertrophic response. I don't know if I would bet on that happening realistically, but there is still the potential for that to happen as long as you keep your intensity and proximity to failure adequate. If you start training in this four, five, six reps in reserve mark, I don't really think that you're giving the muscle much of a reason to stick around because you're not really forcing it to work uh, particularly hard. Uh, in terms of frequency, we can decrease our total frequency by adding in extra rest or removing extra frequency work. Uh, so like I said, you can add more rest days into your split. Uh, if you're doing biceps like every other day, maybe you eliminate the bicep work uh, you know, every other workout. So instead of doing it every, two, or every three days, you're doing it every five, uh, something along those lines. However you want to go about reducing your frequency, uh, you can go about doing that. So... Um, that would be another thing that I recommend. Uh, and then as far as your load, I would keep your load high unless you're injured. Uh, the main goal is to keep the accumulated strength that you have spent week after week, month after month, year after year building up. You want to keep that. You've worked really hard to get your press from this weight to this weight. You want to keep this weight uh, as much as you can. So I'm gonna show you guys exactly what this looks like using my personal training. So I'm gonna show you guys what this looks like in my personal split, uh, as well as show you guys what this looks like uh, using each individual session. So my current split is a four day split per week. So I train legs on Sunday, pull and quads on Tuesday, legs again on Thursday, and then Friday is a push day. Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday are my rest days. So I have four training days and three rest days during my week. When I deload, I will still hit my normal uh, leg day on Sunday. I'll take a rest day on Monday again. Uh, I will still take uh, the normal pull day on Tuesday. Depending on the level of fatigue and depending on how my knees feel, I may or may not do the quad work at the beginning, which is why this says plus or minus quads, because that's really dependent on how I feel at that particular moment. Wednesday stays a rest day. Instead of hitting legs on Thursday, I hit push instead, and I remove that second leg day from my training program completely. And then I take a double rest on Friday and Saturday. So during a deload, I'll only train three days per week and I'll rest four days. So basically what I do is I completely eliminate that second leg day uh, and I go from training four days per week to three. So that is a decrease in frequency, which increases my body's ability to recover by adding in that extra rest day. And then when we take a look at each individual workout, I'm gonna show you guys here um, my leg push and pull uh, training templates. And you're gonna see on the left-hand side uh, how many sets I'm doing. And on the right-hand side, you will see uh, how many sets I do when I do a deload workout. Uh, and kind of going back to what I said earlier, um, it's usually a 50% volume reduction. So on my leg days, I'll do two sets of a bicep curl, two sets of a calf raise, two sets of adductor, two leg curl, one leg extension, and two hack squat. On a deload, I'll only do one bicep curl, one calf raise, one adductor, one leg curl. And then with my leg extension, I'll still do one set, but I will either work at one to two reps in reserve, depending on how fatigued I am. And with the hack squat, I will reduce from two sets to one. And then that one set, I'll be working at a two to three uh, reps in reserve. 
For a pull day, right now I have two sets of a leg extension, two of a lat pull down, one upper back pull down, two lat row, two upper back row, uh, two different bicep curls for two sets each, and then two sets of a rear delt exercise. On a pull day, if I feel like I can do the quad work, I'll still do the quad work, but I'll only do one set. Uh, I will re I'll do one set of the pull down instead of two, working at one to two reps in reserve. Uh, I'll still stick with one set of the upper back pull down, but I'll train at one to two reps in reserve. Uh, lat row and upper back row both go from two sets to one with a one to two reps in reserve. And then both bicep curls and rear delts go from two sets to one. And then on a push day, I've got two sets of a lat movement, one pec deck, uh, two incline press, two tricep press, uh, two different lateral raises for two sets each, and then a tricep extension for two sets each. And then on a deload workout, uh, if I feel like I can do the lat exercise, I'll still do it, but I'll only do one set. I'll still do one set of the pec deck. I will reduce my incline and tricep pressing from two sets to one, and I'll also use one to two reps in reserve. And then both lateral raises and the tricep extensions go from two sets to one as well. So overall, in all of these sessions, I'm decreasing my volume by around 50%. I'm basically taking all of the exercises that I do two sets for and reducing them to one. Uh, and then on the uh, exercises during the session that cause massive amounts of fatigue, I will add in a reps uh, in reserve approach in order uh, to mitigate fatigue. So after all of that, what are some of the pros and cons of an active deload? So some of the pros is that you get to stay in the gym and you get to stay in the groove. Like I said, with taking a week out of the gym, uh, it may take you some time to kind of get back into the swing of things uh, and, and really get familiar uh, with how your body uh, feels and how your body is moving once you uh, get back in the gym. If you stay in the gym during your deload, you'll never have to re-familiarize yourself with it because you will have done it uh, over the course of your deload phase. I also feel like it better maintains your strength than rest weeks. Uh, so like I said, you take a week off and then that first week it may take some time for you to get back in the gym and, and get familiar with the weights that you're moving. They may feel very heavy that first week back. If you stay in the gym and you keep the loads high, uh, that won't happen. The, again, for kind of the same reason for the point that I mentioned previously. Uh, and then it also gives you something to do. So like for someone like me, who is an online coach uh, and, and kind of saying, how I said with the, the full week of rest, uh, if I take a week off, I kind of lose the social aspect of my life. Uh, I at least get to go to the gym and do something instead of getting to sit around my house and, 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 and do nothing uh, in a situation like this. Now, some of the cons uh, of an active deload is that you still have to go to the gym. So if, if you're busy uh, and you know life is happening, this may not be very applicable to you because you still have to find time to go to the gym. The workouts aren't as long, but they're still going to happen. Uh, and so you still need to find time to go to the gym. Uh, I do find that uh, usually a lot of people, if they go into the gym during a deload workout, they may have a hard time being focused and motivated to do it uh, because they kind of go into the gym under the impression that uh, this is a deload workout. So like realistically, how much muscle am I going to be building during this workout? Uh, they may like kind of half-ass the workout whether they know it or not. So uh, that can be a con as well. Uh, and then also deload sessions can be rough to start. Uh, your first couple deload sessions, you're probably not going to feel very good because obviously the whole reason why you're doing a deload is because you're tired and you're fatigued. Uh, and so those first couple of workouts, you're still going to be pretty tired uh, and you're still going to be pretty fatigued. So those workouts may be very difficult, even though they're at 50% volume and they're at a scaled down level of intensity, uh, they still may be difficult for a lot of people uh, to go through. So uh, it may not be completely applicable uh, for everybody. Okay, so let's get into some considerations and some other things uh, that you uh, should probably keep in mind while you go into a deload and maybe some things that you can think about uh, and consider uh, as you enter your deload phase. So the very first one is that deloads are not a negative thing and that deloads are necessary uh, for long-term progress. So uh, I kind of touched on this on the slide before. A lot of people will tend to go into the gym during a deload and they may not feel particularly motivated to train. Uh, a lot of people, you know, I've had tons of clients where I tell them, okay, you need to take a deload. And a lot of people are under the impression uh, that that is a negative thing. They're under the impression that they've done something wrong in order to need to take this. And that is most definitely not the case. Deloads are a positive thing. 
And, and I kind of like to flip this on its head. And when I need to take a deload or when I have a client who needs to take a deload, I consider this a positive thing. I consider this something that you have earned. Because as I kind of talked about earlier in this video, the average gym goer and even the average gym rat that really takes training seriously, <clears throat> the average person is not training hard enough in order to cause uh, high enough levels of fatigue to actually warrant the need for a deload. So if you are somebody who is capable of pushing yourself so hard that you cause certain amounts of fatigue that you need to actually take a step back and recover from, you are in a very uh, you know, small portion of people. So that is something that I, I feel when, when I need to take a deload, I'm like, fuck yeah, I earn this. Like I've just busted my ass for the last six weeks. My chest press went from this to this. My pull down went from this to this. My hack squat went from this to this. I've had an awesome six, seven, eight weeks of training. It's time to rest, recover, uh, and do that again. So I, I strongly consider deloads to be positive things. Uh, and I think that that's important to understand because a lot of people are under the impression that a deload is a negative thing, that they've done something wrong, uh, and that is absolutely not the case at all. I also like to use deloads uh, as an opportunity to resensitize to caffeine. So uh, this is something that I feel like not a lot of people talk about, uh, but most people are going to be familiar with the notion that caffeine is something that we build a tolerance to. It's something uh, that, you know, the more we use it, the more we need to take in order to get uh, the same response. I like to use deloads as an opportunity to clear out of caffeine completely because the, the, the workouts are going to be considerably easier. So we probably don't need the caffeine uh, to help boost us through uh, those workouts. And also it gives us an opportunity for us to kind of reset our body and resensitize our body to caffeine so that when we enter the next training block, the caffeine will actually work and it will actually help us, especially when the sessions start to get hard. It's a really, really awesome position to get yourself in where you kind of like get yourself off of using caffeine and then you get back into a normal training block. And then as soon as the workouts start to get really hard, that's when you're like, okay, I can start using caffeine now. And you kind of like pull that card out of your pocket and, and you're able to use that. Because uh, like I said, most people use caffeine so habitually uh, that they don't even feel anything when they take caffeine. And so uh, obviously if you've, if you've got a really hard workout coming up uh, and you're like, man, I need something to help me get through this workout, caffeine is a great tool to use. But if your body is so accumulated and so adjusted and accustomed to using caffeine, that caffeine probably isn't going to work for you. So I like to use deloads as a, a real good opportunity to kind of clear out your, uh, your caffeine um, sensitivity uh, and just kind of, uh, you know, get more sensitized to be able to use it again so that you can use caffeine as a beneficial tool uh, in your next training block. I also like to use deloads as an opportunity to introduce new movements uh, if necessary. So, you know, that's another topic for a different day. I don't like switching my exercises out unless I absolutely need to. But if you are entering a deload, it's very likely that you'll have some exercises in your program that are stalling and are not moving in the direction that you want them to. And so this is a really good opportunity to kind of replace those exercises, find a different uh, alternative, uh, and so that you can use that in your next training block when once the deload is over and it's time to go back. Let's say you're doing a training block and your incline dumbbell press has stalled for four weeks in a row. When you start the deload, maybe you replace that incline dumbbell press with an incline Smith press or an incline incline machine press and then when the next training block starts you keep that smith or machine press in permanently to replace the dumbbell press uh, just because that dumbbell press has obviously not been progressing if it's not progressing it's probably not giving you a hypertrophic response so uh, a deload is a really good opportunity to uh, introduce uh, a new exercise Deloads can and will change from block to block, both in length and in methods. So uh, I've had some blocks where I've been able to go 10 weeks without needing to take a deload. I've had some blocks where I've deloaded and four weeks later need to take one again. I've had some blocks where my deload uh, was uh, the, the split that I laid out mentioned to you where uh, I trained three days per week. Uh, I've had some splits where I've need or some blocks where I've needed to take a complete week off. So these things are, are going to constantly be changing and they're constantly going to be moving and constantly going to be adjusting. So I don't want any of you guys to get under the impression that uh, every deload is going to be the same, both in terms of 
of how long they're going to last, how often you're going to need to take them, uh, and um, uh, kind of like the method that you use, whether you use a complete week of rest uh, or whether you use an active deload, that's always going to be changing. All of these things that I mentioned are all like tools in your toolbox that you can use at the appropriate time. I, again, I don't really feel like there's one that's like wholeheartedly uh, better than the other. I think that there are certain tools for certain situations uh, and I think it's important to use your tools uh, wisely. If you don't feel after, uh, adequately recovered after you do a deload, don't be afraid to extend that deload another week. Uh, you know, if, if you do a one week deload phase and at the end you don't feel considerably better, do a two week deload phase. I've done plenty of two week deloads and I come back from that second week feeling awesome, like really, really, really good. Uh, so, you know, this, this kind of, you know, in, in a weird analogy type of way, this is kind of like, uh, you know, obesity. Uh, and, and kind of like weight gain. You know, I've, I've heard this get said before, like uh, for people who are super overweight and then they undergo a weight loss journey, uh, one of the things that they really mentally struggle with is like the time. How long is it gonna take for them to lose uh, the weight that they need to lose? And the reality of the situation is that if you've spent a long time making a mistake, you're probably not gonna get rid of that mistake in a short period of time. You're probably gonna have to spend, uh, you know, roughly the same amount of time fixing that mistake as you did making it. So if you have pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and you've pushed way too far to the point where your body is way, way, way overtrained, that's probably not going to be something that you're going to get over in just one week. You're probably going to have to do this for multiple weeks consecutively uh, to be able to get that same uh, response. So, so, so don't be afraid to do that. If, if that is what you need to do in order to make progress over the long term, that's what you need to do. This is, this is the exact definition of taking one step back to take two steps forward. So uh, don't be afraid to do that. Now, at the same time, if you're constantly having to deload for multiple weeks, uh, I would deload earlier and I would change your rest to work ratio. So uh, let's say that you're deloading every 10 weeks, but you need to uh, you know, do a two week deload when you do that. I would maybe start deloading every six weeks so that you only have to deload for a one week period of time. And when you look at that over the course of the year, uh, if, if you've got somebody who's doing uh, a two week deload every 10 weeks versus a one week deload every six weeks, at the end of the year, the second option is gonna have you doing less total weeks deloading and more total weeks doing productive training. Uh, multiplied over the course of five to 10 year career, that's pretty significant. So uh, don't be afraid to do a two week deload or a multi week deload. But if you find yourself needing to do multi week deloads every single time you deload, uh, I would consider deloading more frequently so that you only have to deload for, for one week at a time. I think that's gonna be uh, a much more logical approach that's gonna give you better results in the long term. Let's wrap this up. So uh, I've got a couple uh, questions uh, f that are frequently asked of me, whether it's on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, whatever. Uh, these are some of the questions that I get asked all the time, uh, and I kind of wanted to elaborate on them. Some of them uh, I've kind of talked about already, uh, but I kind of want to talk about some more of these. So um, the first one, what should you do with your nutrition during a deload? Whether you are bulking or cutting, I think it is in your best interest to eat at caloric maintenance during a deload phase. So if you're in a caloric surplus and you enter a deload phase, your, tr your energy expenditure is going to decrease, obviously, because you're not training as many days during the week and those workouts aren't as long and they aren't as hard. So your body is going to be burning less calories. And if you're already in a caloric surplus, so let's say your energy intake is here and your energy expenditure is here, if you decrease your energy expenditure, the size of your surplus has now increased. And so you are going to be putting on more weight and more body fat if you don't adjust your nutrition downwards. So I think it's in your best interest to scale your nutrition downward uh, to a maintenance level during a deload uh, so that you don't put on unnecessary amounts of body fat over the course of that deload. On the flip side, if you're in a calorie deficit and you need to deload, I would increase your calories to maintenance. The reason why you are going into a deload is because you're fatigued and that fatigue is preventing you from having good training sessions. The goal should be to get over this deload as quick as possible. And obviously manipulating training, volume, uh, 
volume intensity, load, frequency, all the things that we talked about are going to help you do that. But rest assured that nutrition is also a very important uh, piece of this recovery puzzle. And it is very likely to conclude that someone who is eating at caloric maintenance will recover quicker than somebody who is eating in a caloric deficit. So I would bring your calories up to a maintenance level. If you're eating at a maintenance level during your cut, you're not going to be gaining body fat during that. You're also not going to be losing body fat either. Uh, but you know, this is another topic for a different day is when you do a cut, make sure that you give yourself plenty of time to do the cut properly. Because if you continue to just push through on the cut uh, with decreasing training performance, you're going to lose muscle mass and you're gonna be pretty unhappy uh, with what you get by the end uh, of that cut. So um, I would uh, sacrifice the week, so to say, in terms of fat loss. Mentally accept the fact that you're not gonna be losing fat for a week uh, and start mentally you know, getting yourself to the point where uh, you're focusing on getting rid of that fatigue so that you can get back into the fat loss phase uh, and continue to have success there. Is a week off fine? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I obviously talked about that one. I uh, don't really feel the need to elaborate that one a little bit more, but uh, that is a super common question that I get is, is it okay to just take a week off? Yes, it is. I think that there are certain situations where that is more applicable than others, which I just you know spent an hour plus talking about, uh, but it, it's perfectly viable. If you got to take a week off, that's fine. No issues with that at all. How do I deload during a cut versus a bulk? No differently at all. Whether you're in a bulk, whether you're in a cut, there is no difference between your deload phases. Nothing. Just do the same exact thing. The, the point is, is that you need to take a deload uh, and you need to do that. And, and there's no difference between uh, cutting and bulking aside from the nutrition that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but, excuse me, in terms of actually structuring the deload itself, no difference at all. Uh, the only difference between cutting and bulking in a deload is going to be the nutrition level, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and then the final question is, should you deload during a cut? So the answer is yes, uh, and it is also that you'll probably have to deload more frequently during a cut. Like I said many times already in this video, the point of a deload, the reason why you're taking a deload is because you're tired and you're fatigued and you're not recovering as well. You are going to get tired and fatigued quicker when you're eating less food than when you're eating more food. And so I actually find during a calorie deficit or during a cut that I need to deload more frequently. So instead of deloading maybe every six weeks, I may need to deload every four to five weeks. There is no harm in doing that, as I mentioned, because goal number one of a fat loss phase, goal number one, aside from obviously losing fat, is maintaining the muscle mass that you have built during uh, the bulking phase. And the way that you do that is by maintaining your gym performance. And the way that you maintain your gym performance in a cut, aside from reducing volume, which is a different video for a different day, uh, is deloading when you need to. So if a deload is something that you need to do in order to complete uh, good training sessions and have good productive progressive training sessions, that's something that you need to do. And if you need to do that more frequently, then you just need to give yourself more time in your fat loss phase so that you can still take those deload phases and still be on track uh, to reach your fat loss goals. All right, guys. So after, geez, damn near an hour and a half, uh, that is, uh, that's pretty much all that I got for you guys. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. If you've made it this far in the video, you are a real one. Uh, you managed to sit through all of this and listen to me uh, talk about taking rest uh, for an hour and a half. Uh, I am really, really, really hoping that a lot of the questions that people ask me about deloads got answered in this video. I'm, I'm praying to God that that is the case. Um, if for whatever reason there are any questions that you guys have that did not get addressed in this video, please leave them in the comment section uh, or send me a DM, whatever. I am more than happy to get back to you guys as soon as I possibly can. Uh, if you guys have any more suggestions for videos like this, type of like a lecture type of video, uh, where I make like a PowerPoint presentation and just talk on end nonstop, uh, I would love that. I love making videos like this. It's just a question of whether or not people actually sit for the whole hour and some change uh, and listen to the whole thing. But uh, if, if, if you guys uh, have any suggestions for other topics that you guys want me to cover uh, in, in this level of in-depth, 
I am more than happy to do so. Um, and then finally, why not pimp out my coaching services? So if, if you guys are interested uh, in online coaching, uh, please fill out the application in uh, my bio. Uh, whether you are listening to this on Instagram, or excuse me, on uh, Spotify or iTunes, uh, or you're watching it on YouTube, uh, I will have my coaching application response in the description. Uh, if you want to work with me, if you want me to coach you, if you want to be a client of mine, uh, that is how you go about doing that. So uh, thanks again, guys. Thank you so much uh, for listening to this video if you made it all the way through. I am praying that all of your questions got answered. Uh, but again, if they didn't, just let me know and, and I'm more than happy to elaborate. So Zuki and I are going to wrap this one up. You guys can kind of see she's been sleeping and uh, kind of squirming this whole time. So uh, we are going to get this one wrapped up. Uh, I'm going to get a meal in me. Uh, and then I actually have a client consultation call in about half an hour. So uh, I will talk to you guys in a little bit. Uh, and as always, take care of yourselves, guys. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this. Uh.